about the lockdown regulations. Since our last Corona uh, uh, cast, we've had some good victories as well as the Democratic Alliance, and I want to share just a few of them with you. Um, you would also know that last week I called on the Speaker of the National Assembly, Tandi Modise, to convene an ad hoc committee of parliament to meet via online platforms like Zoom during this period. This is very important because uh, the Constitution is very clear that Parliament must hold the executive and all organs of state accountable. It can't do that if the lights are off and the doors are closed. So we've suggested an ad hoc committee that can meet via Zoom on a regular basis to receive reports, to understand what's going on, uh, but also to ensure that civil liberties are protected. We've seen some really unfortunate events taking place over the last few days of brutality and humiliation being meted out by the South African National Defence Force and other security services on citizens. This is not acceptable. It may be amusing to some people who enjoy seeing this type of thing, uh, but just think for a minute if that was your mother or father or one of your children being forced to roll around in the dirt or perform squats or press-ups. Uh, that's not how a professional military operates, and if people are disobeying the law, then they must feel the might of the law, but the law must follow the rule of law, which means that they must be given an opportunity to be treated fairly and in line with the Bill of Rights in South Africa. So please, a uh, big plea to the SANDF out there, please treat our communities with respect, and we ask our communities to treat the security services with respect. This is a partnership that we need, and let's get through this together. The last thing we need is to have war on our streets while we're trying to uh, fight this, uh, this virus. So please um, uh, abide by that. Um, it's also uh, very exciting to know that we had another big win. Uh, our shadow uh, trade and industry spokesperson, Dean McPherson, suggestion that uh, there is a zero duty on imports of face masks um, was approved. And so we hope you're going to see a large quantity of those coming into, um, in, into the country. And we believe that this will help us to flatten the curve. I've got a few general uh, uh, FAQs that have come through. And thank you very much for those emails that you've sent through. And then we're going to go straight into bags uh, to answer all your labor-related questions. Um, so I've got Marlene from Ranfontein. Marlene says, can, she, uh, can her child visit her father for a weekend during the lockdown period? We've been advised by the, uh, by the department that this is not going to be possible and that we should limit the movement of people during this time. Vanessa from Krugersdorp says that her and her husband are self-employed as electricians and can they go out on call during the lockdown period? Uh, electricians are, 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 are listed as auxiliary services and so you will be able to go out but make sure you've filled out one of those annexure forms which... Uh, shows what work you're going out to do and make sure that you're not abusing it and going out for bona fide calls out. Veronica from Claims here asks, do you need any documents for traveling? Do you need any documents if you want to visit the shop or pharmacy? If you're an essential worker and you're on duty, uh, you would have been issued by now with one of the uh, forms in terms of the regulations, which would allow you to uh, be able to be out there. Make sure you carry it with you at all times with a form of identification. But if you're going to perform any one of the functions that were set out in the regulations, that's going to buy food, going to visit a pharmacy, or going to get a medical appointment, uh, or to perform some other service, you don't need to carry a document with you. Uh, if you're stopped, be polite, tell people where you're going. If you've got a shopping list with you, or you've got a prescription you're going to fill out, uh, have it with you to hand uh, so you're able to demonstrate where you're going. But you don't require a form to go and do one of those basic functions. All right, we're going to go now straight to the labor questions. And um, I'd say I'm very lucky to have Michael Bagram. Michael, do you want to just introduce yourself to everybody? And uh, let's, uh, I know you've got some of the questions that have been emailed through already. You want to traverse Correct. some of those, and then we'll go over to the lives and see what's come through. First of all, thank you, John. I'm very honored to be with you here tonight as the leader and my leader in the Democratic Alliance. I'm very honored to be part of this program. Uh, before I even get to the questions, just to say that I am a labor lawyer by profession and I am the Deputy Shadow Minister of Employment and Labor with the Democratic Alliance. I have been receiving now for over a month various questions about 
the virus and about how it's going to affect employers, how it's going to affect employees, and when is it going to come right, and what sort of money would have to be paid. And we're going to traverse a lot of that today now in these discussions, because a lot of these questions have a common theme, and obviously it's payment, which is the common theme that we're going to discuss today. But what I do want to discuss first, John, is a disaster that's happened now with the Department of Employment and Labor. We have a particular problem, and for over 20 years we've had a problem with the Department of Employment and Labor and its uh, administration, the way it's paying out people. They seem to always lose documents. They seem to have various problems with their computer program. Today, many of our listeners, our discussions, um, wanted to get paid. They had to get paid today. The UIF people have been retrenched in the past. People who have been sick in the past, people who are on the system, just did not get paid today. Um, I have left messages with the department. Um, the phones aren't working. The website seems to be down. We've got real problems. Uh, I apologize to everyone that I haven't been able to do anything specifically because it looks like the department's completely dysfunctional. I hope they haven't crashed. I'm going to carry on trying this evening, uh, but I'm going to get back to people. I've got about a hundred emails from various people around the country, and I'm sorry I haven't been able to get back to you, but I, like you, am desperately struggling with the website, with the phone number, and in fact the commissioner, Mr. Murrupeng, has not seemed to answer that. So we, we've got a problem, and a lot of what I'm going to answer now is obviously dependent on the Department of Employment and Labor being able to function properly. Um, another thing I must say, and um, we, we have a problem with this, but all the offices of the department are closed. So you can't actually walk in even if you wanted to. So you have to rely on the computer. The problem with that is many of the claimants around the country just aren't, aren't on computer. They don't have access to data, to uh, all the various tools you're going to need to be able to apply. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. Also what's happened is Mr. Marupeng, the commissioner, has said that the employers should be claiming on behalf of the employees because otherwise the whole system is going to collapse. So if you're still in touch with your employer, anyone listening out there, please get your employer involved. Let them put in mass applications for it. Now, let me get straight on to the questions, if I may, John. Sure. Thanks, Michael. Um, and, and Michael uh, will obviously keep everybody up to date via the website, da.org.za slash defeating coronavirus, where we'll be able to update you on the efforts to uh, sort out this UIF issue that has arisen. Yes, and just another thing, our website does have all the addresses in it of the department. So if you go onto the website, you'll be able to get as much information as you actually need to get yourself being able to claim. So first we have Reynold Mateson. What kind of leave does apply for this if I must not go to work as the president announced. Now there's different types of leave obviously that one can apply for. Obviously uh, the first type of leave is normal leave. If you have leave, paid leave owing to you, take that paid leave. Um, it's wise to take the paid leave at this stage because at least then you'll get your full salary and also what's happened is when the lockdown is pulled away and we go back to work then you're not going to destroy your employer by saying, now I'm going to take leave because I've had a, a, a horrid time at home. So mm -hmm. take the leave now. Um, just to answer that question as well is that your employer can force you to take leave over this time. Now we've had lots of the questions and you'll see a few of them that we're going to tackle just now. A lot of the questions are, can my employer force me to take leave? And in essence, your employer can. It's done in terms of the basic conditions of Employment Act. We won't go into the niceties of it, but the reality is that they can force you to take leave, and that, unless there's an agreement, you might have a contract of employment that says you have to take leave at a certain time. You could that's an agreement, and you might be able to argue it's just like a school teacher saying, "I'd like to take leave in February," and the school will say, "But you must take leave during the school holidays, obviously." So here you've got the employer saying you're not coming in, so you must take that sort of leave. The other thing is, obviously, sick leave is something that you can access. Um, you've got to show that you're ill. I'm hoping that employers, and we've been sending the message out as the Democratic Alliance, that employers mustn't be so 
fastidious about the medical certificates. If someone says they got flu, they're evidenced of all the all the symptoms, don't go and insist that they must get a medical certificate. The doctors aren't keen to see people. The doctors are now consulting telephonically. It's not going to be all that functional if you make someone go and spend a few hundred rand if they're not on a medical aid, um, let them do it. I've also had a few people who actually speak to their Sangomas. Um, we accepting that Sangoma certificate through this period, it's an extraordinary time, let's accept a Sangoma certificate as being valid, even if the Sangoma or the um, traditional healer isn't registered with a medical council, let's accept those certificates. Sure. So hopefully that answers you on that. We've got Shan Marie van Heysen. Um She says, I have a question in regarding a business that argues that they need to be open during lockdown and that they will not close as they have contacts they need contracts they need to finish in time they build and manufactured armored vehicles for overseas companies can they make employees go to work or do they need to lock down and shut down how do we know well we need to check to see if they can give you a certificate to show that they are an essential service it doesn't sound like they are um, but they might have a, such a certificate they might be able to prove that they're an essential service if they can prove that then they must issue their employees with certificates to say that you can travel to and from work and when you come to work we need to make sure that we look after you we need to make sure that you have all the necessary precautions in terms of health and safety and as you know President Ramaphosa said that every business essential or not has to ensure that their employees are kept safe and healthy and if they can do that and they can show they're an essential service then unfortunately you do have to go into work unless you're sick mm -hmm. or unless you're very scared and you can then show that you might take leave rather or unpaid leave if there's none owing to you. We've got Marnie Whitaker. Um, our CEO has asked us to go to work in the office from Friday morning. I'm a sales rep in the food industry. I was told if I do not report to the office, I would have to take annual or unpaid leave. Is this lawful? And like I explained, yes it is, especially if they are a business that is an essential service, which is food, then you would have to go into the office. And uh, unfortunately, Marnie, if they, you don't come in, it's very kind of them to say that you must take unpaid leave or leave if you've got leave owing, because I know some businesses are in fact taking disciplinary action against people. So I don't think that is so awful. Mm. Um, and therefore, it would be lawful for them to ask Marnie to come in. We've got Karen Poole. Who do we report employers to who refuse to let their staff self-isolate? He is insisting that they come into work. It is not an essential service. It is a factory, but the machines can be turned off. Well, if this is the case, then one reports them to the Department of Employment and Labor. Uh, they are, in fact, already prosecuting people. Mm -hmm. um, I know that yesterday two factories phoned me and uh, asked me for an opinion. They said the department's come in and closed them down. They've given them fines. There's going to be a lot of trouble after this. And mm -hmm. so to answer you, Corin, they can't force you if they're not an essential service. In fact, they mustn't force you and you must not go in even if they do it. And if they take disciplinary action, come back to our website. We'll give you some very good answers on what you have to do thereafter. Then there's Sue Hillier, and Sue, thanks for this. Kindly please advise, can a company force you to make use of your personal leave or take unpaid leave during the 21-day lockdown? And then she goes on by saying, taking personal leave will leave the work worker in negative and thus will have no leave over December 2020. Now, you can't go into negative. Um, I call that leave overdraft. Mm -hmm. You can't go into negative. You've got leave that's owing in terms of your contract of employment or the basic conditions of Employment Act. That leave must be taken during this time. At least you'll get your salary. You can't take leave in advance. That doesn't work. It's not legal. Uh, the whole idea of taking leave annually, and this has been calculated over many years with the medical profession, people need their leave for a whole lot of reasons, but both both for their mental and physical health. So you can't take leave for the next three years and then say, well, now you can't take any leave into the future. You've got to work like a Trojan for the next three years. It's not on. It's not legal. Um, I know there are arrangements like that out there in the workplace. It's not legal. And we're not going to give you advice to do something that's illegal. So no, you can't take that leave in advance and you can't go into leave overdraft. 
There's Russell Dixon Paver. Uh, Russell, thank you. My daughter lost a job as a teacher just before the coronavirus officially step started, but she has been backwards and forwards to the Labour Centre in Pretoria for various trivialities each time and was today turned away because they closed the centre because of the coronavirus and the measures. Now, I know they closed the centre and we as the Democratic Alliance have now tackled uh, the department on this issue. Um, my colleague, Dr. Carter, has written to the minister. Um, he's also sent out a press release to that effect. Um, it's not right just to close the centres down. On top of the centres being closed down, their website's not functional and nor is their phones functional. So I'm hoping that Dr. Cardo has some success. We'll report back to everyone about this. But the centres are remaining to be closed at the moment. It's, it's a real problem. Um, your daughter has to keep trying. Um, obviously what's happened is there's just been a plethora of applications. So much so that Commissioner Marupeng from the department has actually asked people to stop claiming. And he's asked companies to claim on their behalf because he said then they'll be able to handle it. I don't know why they didn't think of it beforehand. I must just tell you a story. About two months back at the Portfolio Committee of Employment and Labor, I tackled Mr. Marupeng on this issue because I was watching what was going on in China. I didn't for the life of me think it was going to happen here, but I did say to him, are you ready for a mass of claims? I said 700,000 claims. Mm. Today it's already more than that, but I was imagining it would be about 700. He said, no problem, not an issue. He then got supported by the acting DG at the time who said, no, we're really ready for this and whatever. I then realized that they're actually talking about how much money they've got, not personnel. The Department of Employment and Labor has 100 billion rand in its reserves. Sure. Uh, they are a wealthy department, unlike most other departments. <laughs> the Department of Employment and Labor is absolutely functional in terms of how much money they've got. The problem we've got is that they unable to actually translate the money into people's pockets and this is the time we are having the worst winter of our lives it's the worst winter that this country's ever been through this is worse than the war we are suffering really badly and who is suffering the most the people out there the workers the unemployed they're suffering out there and i i get the feeling that it's just the democratic alliance screaming mm at the department because they keep telling me stop sending us emails. Yeah. I'm not going to stop. Yeah. We've got to keep going. So Thanks hopefully God. that answers your question about your daughter and I, I hope that she is successful. Michael, there's been a very interesting one come through here um, and maybe we could get your opinion on it. And thank you very much for the work that both you and Dr. Cardo are doing um, on your to, to take this. And we're not going to stop fighting until there's justice for yeah. workers who are are entitled to these benefits. It's not a favor of the government. These are what they are legally entitled to. So keep up the good work there. Uh, June uh, Ratner says, if one is a fixed term contract, can the employer suspend your employment for the period of the lockdown with no pay? Yes, unfortunately, June, I, I must tell you, and you're not going to like hearing my answer, but let's tell you the truth. They can do that. They can suspend the employment. It's a lockdown. If it's not an essential service, then obviously they can't have you there. I mean, they've got their hands tied. And even if it is an essential service, many of those essential services are also shrinking. Mm -hmm. um, today I spoke to a very well-known supermarket group who told me that the shopping has now come to an end. People went and rushed out and bought a whole lot of goods and whatever they needed, and now they're not that busy. So even those essential services are going through an exercise where they're asking staff to stay home. Okay. So, yes, I'm sorry to tell you that, but they can then actually suspend Zenat Smith says, can a big corporate force you to take leave and still make you work remotely during this enforced leave? No, no, no you can't have your cake and eat it. It's a, it's a phrase I hate, but um, I must just tell you that if they're telling you to work, they must pay you. The Basic Conditions of Employment Act says you must be paid for work. If they don't want you to work and that's their choice, then they don't need to pay you unless you have actual leave and they're paying you for your leave. But no one can ask you to work during your leave unless they want to reverse that. 
So to answer you on that one, that's not fair and not right and also not legal. Then you've got an interesting one here, and it's come through from um, Megan, who says um, that uh, I'm a permanent employee, but my employer has made me temporarily unemployed without pay. Is that allowed? Yeah, it's the same thing as saying that you're on lockdown, and so therefore you're going to have to stay at home. You are temporarily unemployed and is allowed. They should try and explore you using your leave or sick leave. Um, one of the leave conditions they should look at. Most employers are using a hybrid situation. Uh, people have a certain amount of, um, call it morality, and we are calling on employers as the Democratic Alliance that if you have the money available, try and do a deal with your employees. Give them 50% to stay at home if you can mm -hmm. afford it. Um, the Democratic Alliance is a party of heart and we're mm -hmm. saying to the employers, please come to the party. We're all in this together. We've got to live through this together. And many of the people that I've been speaking to in these last few weeks before the lockdown, they've been saying, but business is coming to a standstill, what do I do? And I'm saying these are long, loyal employees. Let's give them something, 50% of the salary. Let's see what we can do. Maybe mm -hmm. make put in some claims against the UIF. Let's see what we can do. Let's make this work. But to make you sit at home with nothing, I understand that that's a real hardship that both businesses are going through and every single employee. It's a, it's a terrible situation. Yeah. Talking about uh, UIF, uh, Stefan, uh, Sean, uh, sorry, Sean Stain here asks, how does an employer claim UIF for employees that have been laid off due to reduced working hours? Can this be done? Absolutely. There's the emergency fund. And you, if you go on to the DA website, uh, we have that document on there where you can show how you can claim against the emergency fund. Um, yes, it's not a handsome payment, um, but it's up to 17,100 Rand, and it's for three months. And I think it's worth actually applying. The businesses should apply for the employees. Um, I, I know that many of the people that are phoning me, I've, I've handheld them through that exercise. Okay, and this probably ties in, Michael, with the concern that you raised around the UIF and the fact that there's... No one answering the questions. Uh, one of the uh, submissions here is, having submitted the required email to the UIF and the SMME fund without a response, how should we as a small business proceed? How do people follow up on these yeah, UIF it, it, claims? It is a real problem. <coughs> and in fact, what I am doing, and I, I'm going to open myself out to this, but I am allowing people to actually email me. And let me try on behalf of individuals. I do have a line through to the commissioner. And the commissioner has, up until Friday, been answering me almost immediately. So let me try again. Uh, I haven't been very functional today, I must admit. Uh, no one's answered me. You've got to keep trying. You can't give up the ghost and at least send it through to, mm. uh, to the leader's office. Mm. Um, the leader's office is sending those emails on to me. Mm. And we're having success. Um, let's hope we can have that success for you as well. Sure, thanks so much. And then um, the email address where people can send the form, the UIF forms to the UIF address. Do you have that? Or I don't have that. We'll post it on our website. Yeah, we'll post it on the yeah. website then um, for you to have a look at there. Um, www.labor.gov.za. Okay, we've dealt with uh, Albert. We've dealt with your question about what is the process of an employer applying. Um, I'm unemployed and I've uh, made the application and I haven't heard anything yet and there's been no payments yet. Obviously, that's part of the, the thing we'll that be following up. That is part up. of the problem that we're following up from. Also, you must understand that they're going through an unprecedented amount of applications. Um, just to share with you, I went on to the Israeli Department of Labor website to have a look at it. Uh, that crashed last week. Okay. They, were, they were getting 9,000 claims per yeah. hour coming in. And the whole thing just crashed down. I don't know mm. what it is like now, but mm. I know we have a few people listening to us from Israel at the moment okay. because they've been writing to us saying, how do we get it sorted get it right, out? Yeah. Some of ex-South Africans who are DA members are looking at that. Well, I think this is also one of the things about about coronavirus and, and COVID-19 is that, you know, it's not just uh, affecting one part of the world. It's the entire world that's the actually... World. And I think that the way labor and unemployment benefits are processed and dealt with are going to change fundamentally, Michael, uh, as a result of the experience from COVID-19. If you could change one thing coming at the end of this in terms of dealing with 
uh, unemployment benefits. What would that be? Well, I'd first of all change some of the personnel in the Department of Labor, I must tell you. I'd also change the people who are running this because, as I said, the money's there. This is the time. This is the rainy day. The employees need the money desperately. And the DA has been crying mm. for help, and we're just not getting it. So mm. what I would do is I would step in very quickly. The SAP system, which is a fantastic computer system, has been bought and is used in South Africa for our department. It doesn't seem like we're able to use it. It doesn't mm. seem that we have the proper engineers working this because how can it just fall apart? And mm. it just has fallen apart today. People were expecting their monies to pay rental, to mm. buy food. I had two separate calls from two ladies, different parts of the country this morning. Mm. Both of them have got no food left in their house, nothing. And it's now come the end of the month and they haven't got their payment. Um, and I've, I've been onto the department and I haven't had a response. Now that's completely dysfunctional. Mm. I can understand that the department says we run out of money. Mm. I can understand that the department says that we, 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 not, we can't work out what the issue is with this particular person. These are simple claims. People who have been retrenched and dismissed or put on short time. And yet those simple claims can't be answered and it's purely the function of a system. And no government can afford to have a dysfunctional system like we're experiencing in this country. It will not be acceptable under a DA government at all. Mm. Um, Mario asks here about uh, them being told you can't claim during the same four-year cycle. Um, no. And will, will that apply in this case? No, not at all. That is completely suspended. The emergency fund is for someone who is not working because of the virus. If the business is closed down, they're on shutdown, it completely suspends all the other rules, and at least the government has come forward with that and said we will give you access to the emergency fund. The problem is you're not getting the money out, but that's, that's the other issue. Okay, here's an interesting one, and it's one that I've had, uh, had a few calls on during the course of the last few weeks, and that is, can an employer take disciplinary action against you if you are unable to come to work because schools are closed and you've got nobody to look after your children? What is the situation then? Yeah, it, they can. And we actually asking as a party, we're asking the parties not to take disciplinary action. We're asking employers to have a little bit of empathy in this situation. It's a, it's a, a situation that we'll, hopefully we'll never experience it again, not in our lifetime or our children's lifetime. People have extraordinary set of circumstances. By law, mm. they can. If they say, we need you, I need you to work that machine, no one else can, and you sitting at home looking after your children, can't you find mm. the father to look after the children or whatever, mm. they can take the action. We are saying, and I've advised everyone now for weeks, please do not. Yes, you can tell the people that this is an extraordinary set of circumstances. Mm. We won't accept this in the future, but we understand that the children are at home. It can't be that we just say you've got to leave your, your minor children sitting at home and looking after themselves not yeah. acceptable. Yeah. Mark, um, there's um, a question here about commission earners and estate agents, sales reps and the loss of income there. Uh, would they qualify to be able to put a claim well, in? Well, it's, it's a, a question that's got a barb to it. And the barb mm. is if you have as an employer, if you've actually registered them for UIF, then they can. And how do you work out how much they're earning? You take their last three months worth of commission, you divide by three, that's their monthly amount, and then you can claim. That's only if they're registered. I'm only talking about employees that are registered. If they're not registered, then they are small businesses. An estate agent who is not an employee is a small business within him or herself. They can then register under the small business claims. And there is a claim there for small business. And... Um, my, my colleague, uh, Henro Kruger, um, he, he is an expert in this area and is helping small businesses claim. You could get also off the website, you could get his email address and he would then be more than happy to help out any small business. Mm. Um, I know I've been referring small businesses to mm. him and Henro has been on the ball. He's yeah. knocking it immediately. I think Henro, Dean, Jordan and a few other people have been doing some great work helping people access those forms and get them on there. Here's an interesting one. Um, in an essential service, uh, can you be forced to work uh, without pay? No, no, no. There's no such thing as work without pay. What is happening 
um, and, and I think rightly so, is that employers are saying, listen, we're struggling. We are an essential service. Our work has come down to a minimum. Are you prepared to come in, help us out, and work with a discount? In other words, take a 20% less salary and maybe work a little bit less. Um, and there's lots of those agreements. It's been amazing. I must just quickly tell you as an aside, uh, the textile clothing and textile industry has signed a, a, a momentous agreement. Uh, we've never seen this in this country. I mean, I must tell you, the unions and the employers, with government in the background, got together and found an agreement where the employer would pay a certain amount, the government would pay a certain amount, and the funds within the bargaining council would pay a certain amount. It's an amazing agreement. I wish other industries would do that. But this is how parties working together. Mm. So the Africans do have the resilience to say, listen, we've got a problem. Yeah. Let's make this work. So yeah. hooray to the industry, to the clothing and textile industry, and my hat's off to the negotiators. Mm. Uh, there, I'm, I'm absolutely amazed. Yeah. Uh, and just another piece of amazement that another part of the Department of Labor is the CCMA, the Commission of Conciliation, Mediation and Arbitration. They've done amazing work during the lockdown. They are trying to settle parties telephonically. Mm. In other words, there are disputes out there. They know that we're getting in hundreds of thousands of disputes and they're trying to find a via media in the parties telephonically, which is also absolutely amazing. And mm. many of these commissioners are working from home and they're doing it off their own phones yeah. and they're doing it so we have got some heroes and we're gonna we're gonna have yeah. lots of experience I, of heroes i think that you know these types of situations always bring out the best in, in people and you know things that have seemed impossible in the past suddenly become possible but it's only when you have that partnership in working together so i think during this time michael we're saying to employers to be a little bit more understanding to employees and try to make a difference i've got a question here through uh, from a small business they say they want to help, our, we want to help our employees, but we also need to survive. Is it better to wait for things to get clearer before applying for URF? So that will be on the 15th of April. What would you advise? As a Anna, apply immediately, okay. especially with their backdrop and their, their hitches that they've got. Apply immediately. What some small businesses are doing, and I know this is a radical approach, but I want to keep small businesses alive. We need to make sure that when we come out of this virus, that our economy kickstarts again and those small businesses are the backbone of our employment situation in the country. As you know, John, we have ten and a half million South Africans that at the last count, um, I reckon it's eleven and a half now, but we were at ten and a half million South Africans unemployed. Some of the businesses are saying we're now going to the wall. We might have to liquidate, we might have to close down. I'm saying to them rather a trench with an agreement with the staff that as soon as things are right, you will come back. Mm. Because the retrenchment might actually put more money in the employee's pocket than the, the, the emergency right. fund. Yeah. And so I've said to these small businesses, you need to stay alive. You also mm. need to stay alive specifically because your staff need something to go back to yeah. when this nightmare is over. Yeah. When you wake up from this nightmare, we want to know that you've got a place to work. Mm and we can't have the businesses closed. Yeah, I think that's a very good point, and it leads me into one of the questions that we've received here uh, from Tariq. He says, as a small business, we're very trying very hard to pay our staff 50%. Uh, would we be legally required to pay them the balance uh, when they return, or can they take that time as annual leave, or that uh, pay as annual leave? Well, obviously they must. Now, I'm, I'm praise that, that small business and that, that uh, person who phoned in, because they're at least paying the 50%. You can still keep the wolf from the door. You know, put some bread on the table to your family, at least they're paying the 50% if they, can, if they can afford it. Some businesses can't afford the 50%. But unfortunately, many businesses are saying to me, they can't afford to pay anything. They're not getting any income. They can't afford to pay any, anything. Everyone should go and register with the UIF. Mm. The UIF has money. Let's not worry about government right now. They have the money. They've been putting this money aside now for 25 years. Let's use that money because it's a rainy day right now. It's pouring. It's and pouring I with rain right now. I don't think we're ever going to have weather this bad. Yeah. And who needs the money? Mm. It's our employees out there. Yeah. The people who are keeping the economy going are the employees, yeah. not the owners. 
It's sure. the employees. So let's make sure they have something in their pocket. Michael, the last one I've got time for today, and but please understand we will continue. We'll have Michael back on over the course of the next few weeks to uh, make you a regular slot because there seems to be a lot of interest here. And I'm sorry we can't get through every one of the live questions that are here, but please send them through to uh, the, the website uh, and to the email address. It's coronavirus at da.org.za. And we will do our best to get answers uh, for those questions for you from Michael. If your employer has never registered you, you on UIF, are you still eligible? Absolutely. Okay. Your employer's got trouble. Okay. And you need to report them because that's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. they, you are going to be able to apply. The department will make sure that they give your employer an account, back pay from when you first started. They're going to have to pay it in. They might even get a fine and some interest payment as well. But you're entitled to it. I want to tell you quickly, if you've got one minute to hear from me, but I have had literally hundreds of domestic workers telephoning me, saying that they are now told not to come in, understandably, mm -hmm. and they want to claim, but the employers never, ever registered them for UIF. It seems to be rife in that particular industry. Here's the, here's the golden thread running through the virus. All these people are being forced to register now, so at least the employer is told that you have to pay, you're going to have to pay the full back pay, and the domestic now has the full cover. And we've been making sure that the mm. so-called madams are being forced to register every single one. So I think in the last month I've registered about 200 of these people. Mm. Uh, the department owes me a big commission <laughs> because I've managed them all, but the reality mm. is you can't leave the domestic worker high and dry. Mm. And so to answer you on that one, if your employer hasn't registered you, they need a good smack, they need to register you, and you need to report them immediately. You, you can't be left sure. in the open. So there we go, Marilyn. You've got, the, you've got the answer to your question there. Before we close today, um, I want to just say a few thank yous. First of all, uh, as you would know, the Motsepe Foundation uh, have donated over a billion rand to the uh, special fund that's been set up to alleviate small business. And I'm going to have our trade and industry and finance spokespersons join me uh, on the next Corona cost to take your question about how, we, how this fund is going to be used, how you access that fund, what are the best ways to do it, what are the, what are the requirements. But thank you to the Mitsepe Foundation and also to NASPERS, who yesterday announced a 1.5 billion uh, rand, rand donation to that fund. All this to keep small business going and to keep the doors open of these businesses and to keep the economy moving. And then to our brave men and women in the security services, to our frontline staff, nurses and doctors who are combating this virus every day, thank you very much. But today's Corona Cost is a special shout out to our farmers, our farm workers and all of those people in South Africa responsible for food production. Thank you for keeping the food on the shelves and keeping our nation fed. It's very important in this time that that food chain continues to operate. So if you're a farmer or a farm worker uh, or someone involved in, in, in the food chain, today's shout out goes to you. Thank you so much for what you're doing to keep South Africa moving. That's all we've got time for this week, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We look forward to seeing you all again on Tuesday at 2 p.m. for the next edition of Corona Cars. Stay safe out there. Keep the personal hygiene going and let's take care of each other, South Africa.